in the room together. And also, yes, um, we are so happy. Uh, uh, so, those of you, thank you very much to those of you who are joining us online. This is our first Centre for Medieval Studies hybrid York Medieval Lecture. So, we know that you're at home cheering as much uh, for joining us today as those of you in the room, but it is great to be back in person. And it's a particular pleasure for me to welcome our speaker for the York Medieval Lecture this evening. So before I introduce her, can I just ask you, please, those of you watching from home in the chat, just to let us know whether you can hear us. A few thumbs up or yeses would be great. And if not, we will address the technology. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so, um, it's a particular pleasure to welcome this evening Professor Catherine Clark, Director of the Centre for History of People, Place and Community at the Institute for Historical Research. Catherine has been a great friend and colleague for many medievalists um, over several years, really ploughing a furrow in interdisciplinary study. And I'm sure many of you will be familiar with her research projects at Chester, at Swansea, and we look forward this evening to hearing a little bit more about those projects, as well as a recent current scoping project from the AHRC on the future of towns, which is very timely. I should also put a plug in for the good old Victoria County history, um, uh, which Catherine is closely involved in and, of course, continues to be one of the most important uh, scholarly resources for us still to use today. So I hope what we'll look forward to this evening is a wonderful combination that we might expect from a York Medieval Studies lecture of great scholarship, exciting ideas, and a real interest in bringing the story of people, places, and things to wi as wide an audience as possible. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming Professor Catherine Clark. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Kate, and for the uh, invitation to be here today. I'm just as thrilled and excited as you to be in a room with other people talking about medieval things, and of course joined uh, by people online as well. It's wonderful. And with it being the first hybrid event, anything can happen, so it's, uh, it's an exciting ride as well. Um, if at any point anyone either in the room um, or online can't hear me, um, somebody um, let me know, make sure that I'm aware of that person. Thank you. So for this lecture, I was uh, invited to reflect on some of my work on towns in the Middle Ages and in the present. And I'm going to touch on some of the, the past research that Kate mentioned on Swansea, bringing in some new perspectives, as well as the St Thomas Way pilgrimage project. And the thing about these public facing projects in the public realm is that they are live and evolving. They can come to mean different things over time, um, as we'll see in a moment. But I want to begin my lecture not in the medieval past, but right in the present day, in the middle of current policy, strategy and debate about places and their futures. Slide. Right. So throughout 2021, I was co-investigator on an AHRC funded research scoping project, Towns and the Cultural Economies of Recovery, examining, are we all right? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So I was co-I on this project, Towns and the Cultural Economies of Recovery, examining the research needs and priorities around levelling up, I'm not here this evening to tell you what levelling up means, I'm afraid, um, and the place agenda. Working with a range of partners, as you can see up on the slide, we looked at the 101 places receiving investment through the government's Towns Fund programme. We focused particularly on how these places are using culture, including heritage, to resource and drive regeneration and development, as well as how they're measuring the impact of culture and how culture enables them to reimagine potential futures for their places. Our project revealed a range of research gaps and needs, 
including the crucial importance of what we've called micro place in place policy and strategy. Our reports highlighted the pressing need for research and analysis at the hyper local level and the crucial importance of understanding micro places, places at the most granular level of specific wards, neighbourhoods, streets and postcodes in regional development. Now you'll know of course that so much place policy is really broad brush. Think of the language of the north or the red wall or even towns as a category. Think how capacious and problematic that is. But in our project case study towns, we saw how needs for renewal or development could differ radically, even just from one street to another. Of course, there is some really excellent place renewal work going on across the country, inspired and driven by deep, close engagement with very specific locations and sites, sometimes even particular buildings. The programme of Heritage Action Zones or High Street Heritage Action Zones led by Historic England is a great example, focused on specific built heritage assets, as well as their cultural stories, from Lowestoft's Victorian Post Office to Darlington's Railway Heritage to civic buildings in Barnsley. And I've been hugely inspired by the Street Life project here in York, which has won, I think it's almost half a million pounds, isn't it, from the government's Community Renewal Fund. The project aims to bring the history of York's famous Coney Street back to life and to look ahead to York's future. It's a partnership, of course, with academics here in the university, including um, the CMS's own Kate Giles. It's such a great model of how research can meet regeneration, community co-production and creative practice. And I'm really excited to see the project develop. I'm about to begin a smaller scale project of my own with colleagues at the University of London and partners Historic England, looking at the creative repurposing of heritage sites. That's a cornerstone phrase in the leveling up prospectus, looking at how both tangible and intangible heritage assets are reused to shape places. So in this lecture, I want to undertake some of my own experiments in thinking about micro places as a methodology for research into the Middle Ages and as a tool for connecting the medieval past and places in the present. What happens when we focus in at the very smallest scale, a specific street or square, perhaps even a gate or doorway, a tree or well, or a very specific position or vantage point? How far can we push a multimodal, multi-sensory, experiential approach to reanimate micro places in the past and, and, and why bother do that? What kinds of research questions, methodologies and disciplinary capacities does this require of us? Where does this exercise invite us beyond conventional academic practice into creativity, imagination and speculation? And what are the possibilities and risks inherent in that? I'm alert to what Claire Lees and Gillian Overing have highlighted in their book, The Contemporary Medieval in Practice, as the potential dangers involved in new audiences, modes and collaborations, and as they put it beautifully, the risks of falling and failing between disciplines and practices. So what can a concept of microplace add to our tools for research and engagement, as well as our resources for interpreting, shaping and renewing places today? And beyond a model of historical research as resource for place renewal, compliant and complicit with place policy, what might it disrupt, trouble or resist? So I'd like to visit several uh, medieval micro places over the course of this lecture as a way to explore and interrogate this concept for our research. And the first is a place that I investigated as part of a collaborative research project a few years ago on medieval Swansea. So this project took as its starting point um, a strange and fascinating event that occurred in Swansea in 1290. A Welsh outlaw, William Cragg, was hanged by the Anglo-Norman Lord of Gower, William de Brios. But the story doesn't end there. William Cragg came back to life. 
in what was understood by local people as a miracle of the putative new saint, Thomas of Hereford or Thomas Cantaloupe. Nine medieval eyewitness statements survive in a manuscript in the Vatican Library as part of the canonization proceedings for Thomas of Hereford. And they're a really rich and wonderful source. They reflect very different perspectives on events and on that medieval urban environment. Lord, Burgess and outlaw, religious and lay, male and female, Anglo-Norman and Welsh. Now, many of you will know that this story is the subject of a brilliant micro history by Robert Bartlett, the hanged man. Bartlett thinks about place and he offers some wonderful insights into medieval spatial practices and imaginaries. There's a whole chapter on time and space, but the specificity of locations in the Crag story is missing. The book doesn't contain any maps. The only photo shows Oystermouth Castle down the road in present day Mumbles. So for our project team, that seemed a real missed opportunity for thinking in very rigorous ways about place. And I also think it's a perfect case study for pushing our approach to micro place. So the City Witness Project edited those nine medieval witness statements, linking them to a map and visualizations of the medieval town. We reconstructed the witness routes and itineraries through the medieval urban environment and explored their perspectives, both literal, their vantage point sight lines and metaphorical. I should also say at this point, because we're thinking about these interrelationships between the medieval and the now, that the City Witness Project actually developed directly from an approach by Swansea Council. The city centre or high street in Swansea um, was targeted for regeneration and it had received significant EU convergence funding that's directed at regions within the EU whose GDP per capita is 75% below the EU average and oh how we miss those funds and that support. So Swansea Council aimed to develop Swansea city centre as the castle quarter with a distinctive identity grounded in heritage they were seeking research to help inform and resource these plans. And I'll return to that later in my lecture as I reflect on those relationships between historical research and pleasant, present day place policy. So I want to start by thinking about one very specific site within medieval Swansea at one specific moment, the day of William Craig's hanging. And the site is the West Gate, which hopefully I don't have a pointer, hopefully you can spot on the map there. Um, cited on the route of William Craig's journey from the dungeons of Swansea Castle up to the gallows. And I'm going to use this very simple schematic visualization to put that into context for you. Um, so what we're seeing here is the route from the Newcastle, the corner of the Bailey, along Westgate Street, and out through Westgate, past the washing pool, and on up the path climbing Gibbet Hill to the gallows. Now, as I say, this is a deliberately schematic, basic visualization, not attempting any kind of photo realism, not claiming any, any richer or more accurate knowledge um, than we have for certain, but it allows us to see topography, sight lines, and relationships between places. I think most strikingly, it shows uh, the prominence of the, the gallows, doesn't it? And how visible they are from across um, the surrounding area. We did also experiment with a range of different visualization approaches and idioms as part of the project, including the imagined version of the Westgate um, at the left-hand side here by the brilliant Lorenzo Caravaggi, who's now a Leverhulme Early Career Fellow at the University of East Anglia. Now, I think he would agree that that's possibly a bit grander than the reality of Swansea in 1290, but all these different visualizations serve as provocations, as, as, as starting points for thought experiments and discussion about possibility. None of them claims to be definitive. When it comes to digital visualization for imagining and interrogating past places, York is of course leading the way with your fantastic center for digital heritage, as well as projects like pilgrimage and England's cathedrals or the wider work on Beckett and Canterbury and the center for the study of Christianity and culture. And just as with those projects, the questions that I'm posing here about micro place demand thinking beyond the purely visual reconstruction or, or seeing. So let's stand at the Westgate on that autumn day in 1290 and take in what's around us. And rather than digital tools, we're going to use our imaginations to do that. 
So we're looking out just beyond the West Gate on low-lying boggy ground, the Nantpress stream and the washing pool. And then as you saw, uh, up that steep slope towards Gibbet Hill. The name washing pool likely indicates a place where townspeople came to wash laundry, a focal point for social congregation, perhaps especially for women, even though just outside the town walls. The conspicuous visibility of women here on the day of William Craig's hanging might have served to further reinforce the parallels between Craig's execution and the biblical crucifixion story, or rather passion and martyrdom narratives, which we see surface in many of the witness testimonies. Craig passing the women of Swansea on his way up to the place of execution on a hill outside the town might call to mind associations with the presence of the women of Jerusalem in Luke's gospel. Terrain and topography are significant here in a number of ways. The LIDAR data for our topographical modelling, of course, comes from the UK Environment Agency, where one of its primary purposes is examining flood risk. And this is low-lying coastal land. We can imagine the mud and the squelch of this area just outside the West Gate, not easy going um, for the execution party as they make their way out of the town. The risks inherent in that, I think. Thinking about natural environments and ecology is all part of our picture. For me, it throws into question the Lord Steward, John of Bagaham, claims in his testimony to ride up and down Jubit Hill multiple times during the day, being very busy and important. Um, and just thinking about terrain actually really throws that into question um, for me. So what about sight lines and view sheds? Within the gate itself, sight lines might be limited, but just outside or further in on Westgate Street, the gallows on Gibbet Hill, as we've seen, would be strikingly prominent. The statement that makes about the Lord's power in the landscape, the Lord's vengeance being enacted within the landscape. Adam of Lucker, one of the witnesses to Craig's hanging, he was aged about 14 um, at the time of the event. He describes watching the execution from a location either just above or near to the West Gate on the town walls. He tells the papal inquisitors that the gallows was, in his estimate, about two crossbow shots from his vantage point on the walls. Um, and the Latin term he uses, ballista, is a little bit ambiguous. It might refer to a, a larger kind of catapult weapon, as well as a handheld crossbow. But Adam's description fits with other evidence for the location of the gallows in medieval Swansea. So there's a, a very basic uh, visualisation of the, the gallows site in, in uh, relation to the West Gate. And I wanted to show you this because I think it's the first hint of how history in place can present something more um, uncomfortable and confronting for our, our narratives of our places. You might just be able to make out on the, the Board of Health map on the left-hand side that in the mid-19th century, this was still called Gibbet Hill Road. By today, in the map on the right-hand side, you can see it's renamed North Hill Road, eliding that historical violence and trauma in the urban landscape. We all know, don't we, history-driven placemaking is selective. A leisure complex in Swansea, located at the site of the city's at South Gate, was recently renamed City Gates, excavating meaning and status from the city's history. No one, of course, is in a hurry to bring back the name Gibbet Hill. We'll probably uh, bring down house prices apart from anything else. <laughs> so back to the West Gate. What might we hear standing in our medieval Swansea micro place? Behind us, the bustle of the town and trade, the noise from the execution party growing louder as it emerges from inside the, the inner walls of the Castle Bailey, the splash and slap of washing in the pool, the slop of mud, seagulls. Uh, it's easy to forget, uh, of course, medieval Swansea is a coastal town and a thriving port at this time. Perhaps the church bells from St Mary's, I was very much reminded of that, hearing, hearing the minster bells earlier, a big part of the soundscape. Here inside the gateway, the sound is muted as we pass through the soundscape changes again. As many of you will know, there's some fantastic work being done at present on medieval soundscapes and sound sheds. This example from the brilliant recent book by Stephen Mileson and Stuart Brooks on peasant perceptions of landscape in Uelm 100, showing the audibility of church bells at different points in the parish of Nettlebed in the 15th century. With the wonderful Mariana Lopez here at York, 
we created a medieval soundscape for Swansea, but I'll come back to that a little bit later in my talk. So how does it smell here? The sea air, the stink of the mud around the washing pool and the Nantpress stream, the smells of the market perhaps on Wine Street, the trades of Fisher Street and Goat Street, livestock being driven out along the Gower Road. Finally, standing here in the Westgate, we have a real sense of its function as a boundary, a liminal site. The material boundaries visible within the urban landscape of medieval Swansea were in fact all porous and permeable, as is usually the case in a medieval town, but they could become significant barriers through the power of social convention and normative spatial practices and controls. So on the day of William Craig's hanging, the West Gate is the point beyond which the priest and the de Brio's family chaplain, William of Coddingston, will not pass. He tells us that because of his priestly office, he did not wish to accompany the said criminals when they were led to be hanged outside the town of Swansea. This is the point at which he stops. Stepping beyond this gate would take Coddingston to a, a space of shame and disgrace outside the order of the walled town itself. What we're seeing here is the effects of social expectations and self-regulation. The West Gate is heavily freighted as a spatial and cultural edge. We could take this so much further, but rather than pretending to give a definitive full account of Swansea's medieval West Gate, I, I really want to extend this as an invitation. What places do you work on? What sources and tools could you use to open up a full understanding of Microplace? and how it was experienced in the past. And I think this brief experiment raises questions which can be answered or partially answered through research, but as is often the case with micro history, also invites creative speculation and imagination. I recently played a small role as a consultant on this Radio 4 programme, which evoked one November night in 1120 through immersive audio and soundscapes. I'm also writing a piece for a Routledge collection called Portraits of Medieval Europe, a follow-up to this book focused on Eastern Europe, which reanimates medieval places with creative pieces grounded in detailed research. I'm also currently co-investigator on a really exciting project, um, AHRC-funded project, which is led by Victoria Flood at Birmingham, looking at Alderley Edge in Cheshire. We're working with teams of creative practitioners to develop immersive AR resources for visitors to the National Trust site. And I've learned so much from our creative partners there about uh, approaches like micro navigation or attention to the tiniest found objects or details in place as a way of enriching our understanding and experience of sites. So how do we navigate that fine balance between authority and accuracy and the enormous power of immersive engagement with the medieval past, not just for purposes of public interpretation, and I'd want to stress that this isn't something that we do just for engagement, but also as uh, a research practice for ourselves as researchers. For digital visualization initiatives such as the London Charter have attempted to provide standards for making legible what's fully evidenced by research and what's conjured by imagination. But it's not merely an issue for those working with digital tools. Perhaps there's a need here to be more explicit, open and positively assertive about the role of imagination in our scholarship, especially as this increasingly opens up as an area of interest for academic historians. Our experiment thinking about Swansea's Westgate is focused on a single moment in time, but it can also be productive to trace the story of a micro place through time, allowing us to explore its biography and to understand in context cycles of development, decline and renewal. So before I move on, I want to touch briefly on another example in Swansea, which is um, the site Wassail Square you can probably see just down the bottom left hand corner on this map. And as you can see from uh, the detail here, it was uh, again in the west walls of uh, Swansea, just down below the west gate. On the day of William Craig's hanging, a local Welsh labourer, John App Howell, watches the execution 
Um, he tells us from somewhere near the Wassail Gate. He just tells us that he watches it from an open area near the Church of St. Mary. And the word he uses is platea. Um, that might suggest an open square or a wide street, but probably not um, a churchyard, which would have been denoted more explicitly. Um, our 3D models show that a location immediately inside the Wassail Square or adjacent to St. Mary's Church would have had its sight line significantly limited by the proximity of the town walls. So it's likely, uh, as marked on the map here, that John and the rest of the crowd watched the hanging from this triangular or funnel-shaped area just outside the Wassail Gate, later known as Wassail Square, where they would have had a clear view up along the western edge of the town towards Gibbet Hill. And it's possible, in fact, that this area may have functioned as a secondary marketplace for the medieval town, supplementing the main Anglo-Norman market adjacent to the castle at the top of Wine Street. Its location just outside the walls suggests that it might have primarily served the local Welsh community. These triangular or funnel-shaped forms have been identified as characteristic of earlier medieval marketplaces before the introduction of planned market squares in the later Middle Ages, and they are characteristically found just outside um, abbey walls, for instance, or gateways. So on the road west leading to the Gower, this site would have been particularly convenient and attractive for the local Welsh community, and gathering or trading here may have been as much a positive choice as the result of any exclusion or disenfranchisement in Swansea's main urban market. So perhaps there's informal trade and commercial activity around us in the Middle Ages here. Um, perhaps it's mostly Welsh that we can hear being spoken in this site. Perhaps this is the focal site of a, of a subaltern community, the local Welsh under Anglo-Norman colonial rule. Just yards away from the West Gate, this micro place has its own very distinctive character and community. In the post-medieval period, Swansea's, Swansea's Wassail Square or Wassail Street is characterized by inns and hostelries, probably developed in part due to its location on the western fringe of the town. Um, in early, gui early guides to Swansea, I love this, the area also becomes known as the World's End, probably due to its association with lodgings for, for travellers, um, itinerant populations, but it's kind of haunted by quite pejorative associations, I think, uh, isn't it? And moral anxieties, I suppose. Wassail Square endured very heavy destruction during the Swansea Three Nights Blitz of February 1941, and then it fell within the compulsory purchase order zone of the 1947 redevelopment plans. Further house clearances in the 1960s led to its ultimate removal. And at this point, Wassail Square was permanently erased from the streetscape of Swansea. Today, the historic Wassail Square has vanished. Its name is no longer on any street maps of Swansea. But the brilliant Swansea local historian Gerald Gabb has used Wassail Square as a, as a micro place for a provocative re-evaluation of post-war urban planning in Swansea, which as some of you may know is often the subject of uh, criticism and denigration. In his article, How the Blitz Changed Swansea, Gab asks us to imagine, quote, that Goering had directed the mass raids of Junkers, Heinkels and Dorniers somewhere else. With the historic center spared the devastation of the Blitz, Gab draws a map of a very different 21st century Swansea, in which much historic architecture, as well as the medieval street plan, has survived. The old buildings are increasingly dilapidated and the town is intersected with concrete flyovers and new traffic management systems. Gab describes a forest of tower blocks in the high street. And finally, he turns his imagination to Wassail Square and its environs. The housing between the market and the gasworks is now the least desirable in town. Wassail Square is the worst. And there have been several plans over the last 20 years to sweep it away. Nothing yet has been done. So it's retained its preserved heritage continuity, but it's deeply problematic. Gab's counterfactual or alternative history of post-war Swansea presents what he describes as a nightmare vision of Wassail Square, a site of historical continuity, but also of neglect and decline afflicted especially by planning decisions which privileged the huge boom in car ownership. 
And I really like the way that Gab's imagined alternative feature, Swansea, shows the power of connecting history and imagination to think about the potential features of place. After all, I think what is policy but an act of imagination projected into the future? It's mobilizing imagination and creativity. It's something we explored in our center last year with a series of online events and workshops, inviting people to join us with writing the future history or making a future map of their place. So one last footnote to this, while Wassail Square is no longer on any Swansea street map, it does in fact still exist in a reimagined form in the central area of the city's 1970s Quadrant Shopping Centre. This central covered court featuring the now defunct Debenhams department store <laughs> is, who knew, it's called Wassail Square, with the arcades leading to it named after other lost streets from the pre-war town. While official plans of the shopping centre show the name, they're not generally used by local people, although it was local participants in the project who told us about this. Wassail Square now functions primarily as the postal address for businesses in the inner zone of the Quadrant Centre. So if we did want to engage in a kind of collective act to bring Wassail Square um, back to life, I guess we, we write letters, address letters to this location, call it back into being. The site of Wassail Square itself is now shown by one of our City Witness Project pavement markers just outside the Quadrant Centre doors, where they open onto Whitewall Street, of course, haunted by the, the former location of the medieval town walls. These markers make visible lost, absent features from medieval Swansea's urban environment, connecting the city with its history. Now, the, Swan the, the Wassail Square pavement marker was there last time I visited, pre-pandemic. But some of these pavement markers laid across the city, uh, city centre several years ago are now disappearing in new phases of urban renewal and development and new rounds of streetscape maintenance and improvement. Wassail Square, I'd like to suggest, is a particularly rich and provocative study in Microplace because it calls attention to uncomfortable and challenging questions for thinking about heritage and placemaking and especially for the relationships between history and our work as historians and place policy. The full, messy, complicated story of Wassail Square makes visible histories of change, regeneration, renewal and decline. It calls attention to process in the urban environment, I think, to dissent, success, failure, loss, Focusing in on the micro place of Wassail Square, we see Swansea Council's own ambitious castle quarter plans in a wider context of ongoing and continuing urban change, revealing them as just one moment in the history of the city's built environment, contingent and transient. And the role of historical research, our role as historians investigating medieval Swansea is also thrown into sharp focus. Our involvement in the Castle Quarter initiative isn't simply a one-dimensional narrative of positive transformation. Already the outcomes of that urban renewal programme are eroding and fragmenting, represented most, most clearly materially in our pavement markers, some now being tarmacked or paved over as new schemes emerge. Some of the latest developments in Swansea um, look at maybe using other medieval place names and street names for new developments and other nice twist on creative repurposing in the urban environment. So within the distance of just a few years, we can see the City Witness Project itself now as a case study, as one moment in Swansea's histories of decline, renewal and change. It turns out the City Witness Project isn't simply a case of academic research resourcing a regeneration scheme. I think it's less compliant, actually, and more disruptive than that, as I've reflected on it anew for this lecture. As a micro place, Wassail Square foregrounds the contested, fractious nature of the urban environment, the limited horizons and ambivalences of development programs, place as a site of debate, divided opinion, tension, from the medieval square just outside the walled Norman town to the world's end of Swansea's wild west, 
from wartime destruction and optimistic, but later derided post-war planning, to the 70s shopping center with its now vacant department store at the center, to the castle quarter pavement markers already disappearing amid other schemes, or even Gab's imagined alternative future, which never existed. Wassell Square brings the frictions of place policy and development into clear view. And that resonates with the question that emerged really clearly during our towns and the cultural economies of recovery project. And I don't have an answer for this question, I've got to say, how do we articulate research impact, which is critical, subversive, or challenging, which is, is dissenting, rather than purely affirming or resourcing? I'm going to move on. Slide. So I'd also like to reflect, before I move on to uh, another project, on the ways in which studying microplace gives us, that, that time spent with a specific place gives us the opportunity to notice and to ask questions about people and experiences that larger scale accounts might overlook, might schematize, might generalize, especially marginalized and minority stories. And I wanted to make sure this evening that I mentioned this, uh, this juxtaposition, I think, of this evening's lecture here um, with another event in York this evening, commemorating the anniversary of the 1190 massacre of the city's Jewish population. Um, obviously an example of a deeply confronting history, which in the words of Sarah Rees Jones, who spoke to me about it recently, doesn't fit the popular or sometimes even the academic image of the city dominated by the minster and the castle. Attending to those difficult stories in place is important work, though it can generate friction with positive narratives of heritage driven placemaking. Thinking with microplace, as we've already seen, places new emphasis on experiential sensory dimensions of place in history. In our workshop with CMS students tomorrow, we'll look at some of the scholarship that I'm building on here and some of the lively current research in this area. And of course, work on microplace is also emphatically public history, public humanities work. There's a rich potential for informing place-based heritage, conservation and interpretation, as we've seen, as well as a clear value for place policy and development in the present day. Some of the most lively areas of research in place studies examine, you'll be familiar with these areas, sense of place or place attachment. Rebecca Madgen's work is really at the forefront of this. Any credible analysis of the affective properties of place and our engagement with it must drill down to the hyperlocal, the truly site specific, and it has to attend to the histories and the stories of place. Reanimating medieval micro places was a key aspect of the St Thomas Way, a public history project funded by the AHRC that I led a few years ago. And I want to, um, in the, the, the last part of this paper, look at um, um, some particular micro places through this project. So remember the story of William Cragg, the, the outlaw who was hanged in medieval Swansea after he came back to life and, and recovered. He went on pilgrimage with Lord and Lady de Brios uh, to the shrine of St. Thomas at Hereford to give thanks for the miracle. And in the St. Thomas way, we built a new heritage route inspired by this historical pilgrimage from Swansea to Hereford, bringing to life the medieval world of the March of Wales, the Welsh borders. Our aim was to animate medieval locations for visitors today, but we also wanted to enable people to visit those places virtually by accessing multimedia resources on our website. And I, I always think that talking about uh, virtual travel and doing things virtually sounds very modern, doesn't it? And it sounds as though it must be digital. Um, but of course, we're responding to a very well-established medieval tradition of remote pilgrimage of virtual travel, imaginative travel. And uh, unexpectedly, uh, of course, the possibility uh, for dis distance tourism um, became a lot more pertinent, a lot more timely when the COVID pandemic struck. So I want to show you how Microplace figures in some of the resources that we developed for the St Thomas Way by looking briefly at a couple of locations. So one of the sites on the way, this is Kilpeck in Herefordshire. Um, in the Middle Ages, Kilpeck was a thriving village, had a, a market. Now it's just a couple of houses, uh, very fragmentary remains of its castle. 
um, and of course the wonderful church with its spectacular Romanesque carvings. The St Thomas Way walking route takes visitors around the medieval landscapes with a range of different interpretation content and we were incredibly lucky to be able to work with, um, as I've already mentioned, the brilliant Mariana Lopez um, in the Department of Theatre, Film, Television and Interactive Media here in York, who created medieval soundscapes for our locations. I'm sure some of you will know her work on the York mystery plays and, and all kinds of fantastic things that she does. So here, um, her soundscape plays a, a lovely role. <laughs> Audio plays a role in that multi-sensory experience of micro place, including as a remote or virtual pilgrim in the present too, this ambient sound uh, captures uh, its uh, yes, the spring bird song and raindrops standing and looking at the guard. Patricio, also on the St. Thomas Way, is a tiny remote church in the Black Mountains, the reputed site of the medieval hermitage of St. Issui. The holy well or spring associated with, this, with, associated with the saint is still there. In the ambient sound of the ocean. You can see here other immersive content that enables um, virtual pilgrims to experience this micro place, including a, a 360 degree tour, which we filmed with a street view camera loaned from Google. And for those who can visit, there's a family activity and a puzzle, both designed to encourage people to interact closely with the place and notice details, spend time, linger, um, give space to their attention um, to the place. So I would say that this is heritage interpretation, site-specific work grounded in a micro place imaginary. And I'd add that even the St Thomas Way, with its attention to places and micro places across the English Welsh borders, is covertly disruptive and subversive in its own way. Ooh. Bit more holy well, always good. Never have too much holy well. Right, so this is a little bit, it's obviously not quite the right orientation, is it, you know, for a, a, a landscape shaped screen, but I hope you can see this um, reasonably well. This is the, the, the route map for the St. Thomas Way. And um, it's pretty, I think. Um, but I think it does a bit more work than that, actually. It's not the way that we're used to seeing the geography of England and Wales laid out. Tiny places, the edges, the margins, those often dismissed as insignificant, are worked into a narrative alongside big and well-known visitor destinations. They're given the same care and attention and privilege. The map makes us see the region in an unfamiliar way. And there's a power and a resistance in that. In this case, attending to medieval places and connections helps us to remake present day geographies, challenging notions of center and periphery, value and significance, enabling us to see new connectivities, relationships, potentials. Geography, connectivity and identity are such major issues for our towns today often measures by which they are regarded as irrelevant or left behind. By thinking historically, imaginatively, by reimagining the map, we can be gently radical. And of course, many of you will also notice other kind of echoes going on in, in that map with medieval pilgrim itinerary maps and, and, and other kind of reconfigurations of space that just kind of disrupt and challenge our familiar geographies. So I'd like to end in the present again, looking towards the future of our places. If thinking through microplates can enrich and extend our research practice as medievalists, what's at stake in terms of bringing microplates firmly to bear on present day policy development and regeneration? Our AHRC Towns project revealed how many of the levelling up towns fund projects across the country are devised by the same very narrow group of consultancies. 
There's an emphasis on shovel ready projects on one size fits all schemes rolled out in very different places. By contrast, with historic England's heritage action zones and the brilliant new project here in York on Coney Street, we see the very best of conservation and regeneration informed by precise understandings of microplace and co-production with local communities. I've not had much time to talk about that, but that is absolutely the core, isn't it? That's so important. Yes, historical research can resource placemaking projects, but it also has the capacity to disrupt, challenge and resist. Some of this is about thinking critically about research impact, finding a balance between making a positive contribution, but also ensuring our academic work isn't merely instrumentalized or commodified or co-opted into, into narratives that we would rather nuance. Generic redevelopment in our places is a real problem, as is gentrification through, I'm not sure this is a word, heritageification, put that there, and heritage washing. But genuine attention to microplace in all its historical messiness and detail, including those overlooked stories, marginalized groups and missed details, can ensure that diversity, complexity, and even friction remain productively present in our places. And I think a lot of this coheres around questions of scale. Uh, micro history claims to look at the small, the focused and scale up to transferable insights to apply to wider contexts. Now, you'll know as well as I do that there are lots of debates, there's controversy around that and whether it can achieve that. And we see a similar tension between scales in current place policy, local needs and distinctiveness can be obscured by national metrics and agendas. There isn't an easy transferability. Sometimes I'd argue, we just need to privilege the micro, the specific, the local to think at that small scale. So uh, I'll end with a bit of a manifesto. Imagining medieval micro places can indeed help us reimagine possibilities for our places in the future. And also to think critically about heritage interpretation practices, place policy, and how we make our localities and communities today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Catherine. You have given us so much to think about, um, and it's a very exciting time for us with the Street Life Project in 